Amen. Amen. No man can see the end of your glory. Thank you for this session. We thank you because we've seen the heart flow of your spirit already. We thank you because we have seen the evidence of your presence. We return all the glory to you once again, Father. Accept our praises and thanks in Jesus' name. From a heart of gratitude, we say thank you, Father. We say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Holy Spirit, for the love for his church, for the love for his vineyard, for his Lord of the people, the love for the men. The protection for the women, the care for the children is everlasting love, it's unlimited love for your umbrella over us. Father, we say, take all the praises in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we want to go into your heart. We pray that you give to us the spirit of understanding. Father, open our mind of discernment and speak to us from the throne of grace. Whatever we say today, Father, let it be back with your power. Let the angels decide and minister to us. And let your love take over the entire auditorium. Let your presence be felt. And at the end of today, let all the glory return to you. And let the blessings be with your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Please have a wonderful seat. Look at your neighbor and say, Happy Sunday. Welcome to this wonderful service. I'm sure the Lord has been good to you in this week. And I'm telling you, the Lord will be good to you in the next week. Say that to your neighbor. Prophesy to your neighbor. Say the next week will be good. Better than last week. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today, as the Lord give us the grace, we'll be ministering on this word. And the topic of our message this morning is nurturing a deep relationship with the unlimited God. Nurturing a deep relationship with the unlimited God. Before I proceed, let me appreciate our Father in the Lord, the missioner of this church, that God has put the direction into his hand, Dr. Pastor John C. Bacon. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me yet another opportunity to share this altar with you. And I pray that God will continue to uphold you, uphold the church, and uphold the commission that he has committed into your hand. Any power that will work against this altar will stand upon the Lord 
the blood that is Jesus Christ and we take authority over such power that such power will not even come in here and if any power for any reason was able to penetrate the fire of God will depend on it it will be devoured and nothing the gates of hell shall not prevail on this altar in Jesus mighty name I greet our mothers, our fathers, our pastors. I say again, happy Sunday. Thank you. Today we want to look at the word of God that says, nurturing a deep relationship with a limited God. And I, want to, I will be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. The apostle of Paul, the apostles to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. Currently, we live in a world where everything appears to be going east and west, north and south. Is that not so? Five, Romans. Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. We live in a world that appears to be going different directions that we do not understand. And because of this, we now see that even in the midst of all this confusion, the children of God themselves, we are getting concerned. We are getting worried. Of course, there is cause for concern and there is cause for worry. But what does this tell us? It also tells us something that probably the children of God do not really appreciate or understand the relationship they have with the unlimited God. Amen. Because if we do appreciate and acknowledge this relationship, we will not be as bothered or as troubled as we most of us are in these circumstances. Because there is nothing new that has been happening. There is nothing new that they are doing that, or that we are seeing that the Bible has not prophesied or that it will come to pass at a particular point in time. But you have this relationship with God and you are proud of this relationship and you are able to flaunt this relationship and you key into this relationship then you find out that no matter what happens around you, the God that is unlimited will always give you direction. I pray that even in this time and period, God will continue to order your steps in Jesus' name. What is the book of Romans telling us? He said, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. If you have NLT version, you can give it to me too. NLT. He's saying that, know that he said, for since our friendship with God, that is a relationship. Amen. Our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. While we are still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Amen. I pray that in this period and circumstances, the death of Jesus will not be in vain in our life. The fact is that God has given us an opportunity as we consign us, establish a friendship relationship with us as a child of God. But the sum of the issue is that when you say someone is a Christian or when you say someone is born again, some people assume that when you are born again, you just take a little bit of religion and you add it to what you are doing before. No. Being born again is a total transformation. A complete transformation from whatever relationship you've had before. From whatever relationship you've been involved in before. From whichever God you have been following before. From whatever you have relied on to order your step before. You are now transformed. Second Corinthians 5.17 said, if a man is in Christ, he is a new creature. He said, the old things have passed away. And behold, they are all new. Because they are new means that you are no longer that person that is so much scared, that is so much bothered about what is happening around you or that feel you will be so much depressed by the situation. But you are not somebody who has been transformed to a new life in Christ. Amen. Amen. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 22 to 24, also portrayed what this what was being said in the book of second Corinthians 5 17. Let us look at Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 4 22 to 24 He said throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life which is corrupted I mean, corrupted by lust and deception that is the old things pass away and the new things come he said instead let the spirit you knew your thoughts and your attitude when the spirit renew your thought and your attitude, it enables you to nurture, to sustain, and to maintain a relationship with the living God. I want you to, for a moment, think in your mind or begin to ask yourself, do I have a personal relationship with God? Think about it deeply. Do you know, do you accept, or do you recognize that you, as an individual, among the billions of people in this world, God recognizes you as a person. Amen. Do you know, do you accept that because of the lineage that you have to God through the sonship of Jesus Christ, you also have the same right as every of the believers that has gone before us, fathers of faith. Do you know that you have a line of communication to God by virtue of your relationship that makes you easier, that makes it easier for you to traverse through the ups and downs and the storms of this present world. Amen. Maybe you know. Congratulations. Maybe you don't know. It's not a problem. That is why God created another opportunity for us to have a discussion around it. That is why God created a message around it. So that you can refund yourself. You can reestablish yourself in this relationship with Christ. He said, let the spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Your thoughts, your attitudes, your approach, your demeanor, whatever you do, let the spirit of Christ in you renew it always. Amen. Amen. The importance of a relationship with God cannot be underestimated. As a matter of fact, it is one of the most important things that was ever 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 present if you look at the bible from the book of genesis up to revelation everything in the bible is about relationship with god god created man for the purpose of relationship with him he created adam it has a relationship with adam satan came deceived them they went away from god and every other thing that has been happening since then is a way for God to restore that relationship between man and himself. Amen. When God was dealing with the Israelites, it was to bring them back to him. When he sent the prophets, it was to bring them back to him. When Jesus came, it was to reconcile man with God so that that relationship will be sustained. And in the book of Revelation, where the Bible ended, it was all about a final reconciliation and friendship with God based on relationship. Amen. 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 So that is the trust of why we cannot underestimate the importance of relationship with God and something that we must follow in every way that we need to follow it. And talking about a relationship with God, it is an essential part of our growth and Christian maturity. Having a relationship with God is knowing God even more than we have known him before. And when we talk of knowing God, it is knowing the totality of the concept of God and what he is to you as a person. In the book of John, chapter 12, um, chapter 17, verse 3, it also affirms that eternal life is knowing God himself. The creator of all things. John 17, 3. This is the only way we can have a deep understanding of our intimacy with God. And he said, this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to heart. That is the way to know God. That is the way to establish that relationship with God 
that can foster joy and peace in our life even more than we think we can have. Amen. God is infinite. He's endless. He's deep. He's wide. So the more we know him, the more we need to know him. The more we know him, the more we want to know him. There is no end to knowing God. There is no end to loving God. There is no end to being under the grace of God. Just like the song we sang. No man can see the end of your glory. No man can see the end of your grace. Inasmuch as the heaven stands above the heart, God will always be exalted because he's the unlimited God. Amen. I pray that God will reveal himself to you in a much more better way this morning that you begin to appreciate the love of God in your life. We may not be wondering in our mind. We want to establish your relationship with God. Where can I find God? You can find God everywhere. Amen. You can find him in your own person. Because God has established his presence for man in several ways. And the first thing is that God is everywhere. The book of Psalms, chapter 139, 7 to 12, established the omnipresence of God. There is nowhere you cannot find God. There is no single place that you cannot find God. 7 to 12, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. 8, we are going to 12. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are still there. Amen. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the Father's auction, next, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. 11. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. 12. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same for you, O oh Lord. He's everywhere. We cannot hide from him. He's available for us. He's available for you. He's available for me. What we need to do is to seek him. He's willing. That is one, one thing about God. He's willing, waiting, waiting, waiting for you. Waiting for you. He said, I stand by the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come inside the house and abide with him. Amen. So he's everywhere. You cannot say, hey, I cannot establish a relationship with God. Where will I find God? It's even not a language that should be found with you as a Christian who have enjoyed the joy of salvation. Who has experienced a personal relationship with God. Because that salvation itself, one of the primary things it does is to establish your personal relationship with Christ to God. Amen. So God is everywhere. His abundance can be felt in everything we do. I said his presence is in almost every place. Secondly, you can also find the presence of God as a believer. Once you have believed, God himself dwell in you. God dwell in you. So you need to nurture, you nurture the relationship. He dwells in you by the Holy Spirit. That is why you become a new creature as soon as you are born again. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What is 1 Corinthians 6, 19 trying to do for us? He is trying to establish the fact that once you have salvation, you don't even need to go to the... See, we just talk about God now. Is that not so? And we said he's in the auction. He's everywhere. You don't even need to go too far. He lives in you. He said, didn't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. So he's already living in you. If something lives in you, that means he's closer to you. Therefore, there is no impediment. To having that relationship with the, with the mighty God. Amen. Amen. And even the presence of God, totally, we are in a congregation like this. God is always present in the local church whenever his people are gathered to worship him. You can always find solace. You can always find peace in God. You can always find him everywhere. First Corinthians 3.16 We know that God dwells among his people. 
at all times. Don't you realize that all of you together, together, the first one he said, you are the temple of God. Amen. Amen. But now he's saying, all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you. That is, whenever we come together like this, we form a synergy. Amen. Amen. We form a synergy. All of you together. So even if God does not live in you, because you have not aligned yourself with God, by the time you are in the midst of the children of God, in the church of God, God lives in you together as his temple. 6.16. Let's look at that same 1 Corinthians 6.16. I think he's trying to tell us something too about the presence of God in this, I mean 6.19 in his people. 6.16. 16. 16. 16. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he became one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united into what? What now happens when you join yourself with the child of God? Amen. Amen. What happens when you become a permanent feature in the presence of God? There is nothing. There is nothing as joyful as being in the presence of God. Because God himself at that situation will manifest his power. How then do we nurture this relationship? How do we rush, nurture this relationship? Having established that God is a relational God who has been with us from the beginning. Remember I told you from the beginning, I said God has manifested himself as somebody who wants a relationship. When you read the first book, the first four books of the Bible, written by Moses. It's all about the presence of God wanting to reunite with man. You go back, you read the book of the prophets, the Psalms, etc. You will also see the dwelling of God among men. Amen. Then you go to the gospel and what is the entire gospel? The entire gospel is all about salvation through Jesus Christ so that we are united with God. So how do we, how can we, how can we nurture, foster, sustain and build this relationship to make it go. There are several ways that God has made available to us. Let's look at the book of Exodus chapter 33 verse 18. And then here the first one we want to say is that you must have the desire. The desire to go deeper with God. The desire. The desire to get deeper with God. Amen. Because for me, one of, one of the few things that I, 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 still, I still find a little bit difficult to comprehend totally is this power of freedom that God gives to man. Amen. Sometimes when I read my Bible, when I do my theological research and everything, I, I'm, I'm always wondering, why is God not even forcing you people, we people, <laughs> to reunite with him? Amen. Because the free will is just so much there. But that is part of the plan of man. He said, we have created you and we have given you the power of choice. Amen. But unfortunately, there's always a consequence for every choice. While you can control the choice and decide what you want to do, you cannot determine the consequence. Amen. You cannot determine the consequence. The consequence is outside of your control. And that is what shows the perfect sovereignty of God. He said, choose what you want to do. But you choose what you want to do, I give it to you. But the consequences, I keep to myself. You cannot control it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I say the desire to know more of God. That's the first thing. In the book, I look at Moses. Moses was telling God, then show me your glorious presence. Please, what other glory is Moses looking for? Amen. What other glory is Moses looking for? It shows that Moses has the desire to know more of God. Moses has the desire to be able to see more of God. Moses has the desire to be able to understand God from different perspectives. Amen. Amen. This is somebody that has seen God appear for him as fire. Amen. Amen. He has seen God perform one of the most wonderful miracles of the world. You know, apart from Jesus and his disciples, the best miracles, fantastic miracles, unbelievable miracles, God performed them through Moses. 
yet he, still, he did not say, I've known God enough. I've known you, God. I know what you can do. I know what. No, he said, God, show me more of your gloriousness. Amen. That is because Moses understands the power of God. There was a place I was reading about Moses some time ago, and that shows you the humility of God. God was so annoyed with the children of Israel. He said, Moses, I will destroy these people. Don't worry. And I will raise another generation through you. That's a golden stick. And Moses will have said, yes. Just destroy them. Uh, let another generation start from me. But what did Moses say? Moses pleaded on their behalf. God, please have mercy. That is the assurance of a man that has a relationship with God. Because Moses has understood from his relationship with God that if you take that offer, you two will meet something. And what will happen again? So he just said, God, he pleaded with passion. Amen. With passion, he pleaded to God. And God answered him. So we must desire to know more of God. And when you desire to know more of God, it's a personal thing. You don't assume that you know everything. The fact is that the Bible remains yes and amen. Every single day we read the Bible, we get new exposition. We get new idea. We get new inspiration. So there is nothing. And again, let me tell you, the more you desire of God, the more God dwells in you. The more you are imbued with armor. It's like in the traditional way, you see, almost everything that happens on the other side of God also happens on the side of God. If you see somebody is going to war, if he, if he belongs to the other side, he's not bothered. And if they ask him why, and ah, oh, may you continue to just saying, oh, may you continue, Baba, me take Are you getting it? It's referring to the relationship he has had with an unknown God. But with your own relationship with God, your ever presence, your ever prayer in the presence of God is part of your own ammunition that you build yourself with that annoys you. You see, when you seek to know God the more, you build and you nurture the relationship. And this is one of the things that will help you to weather the storms of heart. This is when you will know that this is what I should do and this is not what I will not do. Joseph was able to escape that temptation because he knew God. He knows the power of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to do the same. That is when they say, Look, King, our God can save us. And even if he did not save us, just listen, we will not serve you. How many people can say that? How many people can say that? It's a very difficult thing to say. Think about it deeply. I will kill you. You say, yeah, kill me. But now what we always say, you will kill me, God forbid. The God I serve can never allow it to happen. It will not happen. Is that also? And we continue to pray. Immediately you start calling the pastor. Ah, about me, prophet, look, man. About me, Pastor Johnson. Uh, somebody, don't want to. About me, Badua. I must not. Amen. We will not die young in Jesus' name. But they say, look, kill us. God will save us. And even if He cannot save us, we will not bow to you. Absolute trust in God. People will know God, people will follow Him. Look at Joshua, the young man. When the war was so high and he stood beside the two hills of Babylon and Ajalon and he stretched up his hand and he commanded his son, such audacity, such belief in the power of God in you, such temerity for you. Some people even look at him and say, this guy is arrogant. Who are you? Even Moses did not command the son. But he said, you stone, stay there. And the Bible said, that's your joy immediately with your joy and with your Joshua and the sun stood still until the war was won amen. amen scientists have not established it but some people are saying that the leap year it may not be correct some people are saying that the leap year that we see every four years is because of the length of time that Joshua used to stop the sun and it is those hours that accumulated every four years to 24 hours. And that's why you have 29 February every four years. Please put your hands together for Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the power in people who understand 
the relationship they can have with God. Once you have that relationship and you desire for it, it's so much. There is nothing, nothing that can stop you. Secondly, is that we have to acknowledge God's sovereign grace. Amen. God's sovereign grace. And that is exactly what I was talking about when I talk about His grace is sovereign. His grace is sovereign. We need to establish that relationship with Him. Amen. When you, see, when you talk about the sovereign grace, it means that He gives it to you when He wants to give it to you. And then, once you are closer to Him, you get peace in your mind. Amen. Last Sunday, I rushed out of the church because I wanted to catch a flight. I missed that flight. But you know what? I've never had peace in my life like that before when I miss a flight. When I miss a flight before, I'm always bothered. I'm always troubled. I will be trying everything. Immediately they said, sorry, you came late. We closed the flight. I said, is that so? He said, yes. I said, okay, can I get the next flight? He said, not possible today. I said, can you book me on the one for tomorrow? He said, it will cost you money. I said, don't worry, I'll do it online. I'm just going. Immediately she said it. A peace descended on my heart. Because I know I'm coming from the presence of God. Yes, thank God. Those who took the flight, nothing happened to them. Fine. But anything can happen if I'm in, even not inside, where, even when I land, what will happen? And I've always said it, what God does, we does not know. Because it did not happen. So nobody see anything. Those are the joys you get in sovereign grace when you have a relationship. And the peace, the peace that came over my heart that day, even when I got to Mbomi, was looking at me, he said, ah, let me have a quick nap. The only thing to do is to pay me 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 to me at all. I'm not bothered. Only why? Only you seem, I'm completely unbothered. That peace came. And when that peace came, I myself was now wondering, my mind, what gives me so much, really so much realization? And the Spirit of God was ministering to me that, you see only what you can see. Yeah. What you cannot see, you cannot see. And I just begin to appreciate him. I didn't, I didn't bother myself. Amen. So God's sovereignty, we must appreciate. Secondly, we must also, in our quest for the love of God, to nurture it, we must also be concerned about others. First John chapter 4, verse 8. We must be concerned about others. First John, first John, four eight. But anyone who does not love does not love God, for God is love. If you build relationship with God, you must love one another. Even Jesus says, "What is the greatest commandment? Love your neighbor." And the one that follows this with what? He said, "Love God." Sam said, I love God with all my heart, everything, my soul, my spirit, love God. When you love God, you care for others. And I tell you, the whole world, because of that lacking relationship, that is why we are having problems. You know, we don't, we don't have love for one another. If that love is deep and we are able to stand by one another, the world will be a better place for all of us. The world will be a better place for all of us. Unfortunately, Sometimes it is at the point of death that some people begin to realize how futile the exploit of life have been without love for another person. But they see how useless whatever we have relied on, whatever we think we have, whatever we think we have achieved, we now realize that how, how, how useless, how simplistic it is at that point. But the love for one another is part of the way to nurture our relationship with God. Because it keeps you in tune with the love of God, with the loss of God, and with the blessings of God. And I pray that God, in his infinite mercy, will give us the grace and the capability to do that. Amen. 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 Now, having a relationship with God, I also want to talk about um, the mercy of God. We have to pay attention to God's loving kindness and mercy. Amen. Amen. Most of the time we pray. And I've always told people that when we pray, 
we should always finish our prayer with a request for mercy. Amen. We should always ask God to show us mercy. God himself is a God of mercy. We know that. And then his mercy is so endless. Somewhere in the book, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel, um, Exodus 34, 7 first. Exodus 34, 7. We are we talk about I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. Amen. Relationship with God. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin based on relationship with God. But I do not excuse the guilty. Amen. Very deep. That's why we have to be careful. And let the relationship of God lead us. He said, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generation. Does that mean that you cannot escape the rot of what your forefathers have done and that is not your cause? But you can. And the only way you can is by establishing a relationship with God. When you establish a relationship with God, you get out of that cause. The book of Ezekiel 1820. What's the book of Ezekiel 1820 telling us here? The power of relationship, not your relationship with the mighty God. He said, The person who sin is the one who will die. Generational problem will not be your problem in Jesus' name. You will not suffer for what you did not know in Jesus' name. He said, The child will not be punished for the parent's sin. And the parent will not be punished for the children's sins. Amen. Someone will now say the Bible is saying different things. No. Look at the next page. Say, righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteousness. It is only when you establish that relationship with God, you nurture it, then you are able to take yourself away from such ancestral problems. Amen. That's why I always say people should ask for mercy. And when we pray, we should be circumspect with it and maintain that relationship with God. Something happened in my office in Lagos, yeah? About two weeks ago, it's a very sad experience. A very sad experience. A new employee of less than two weeks was crushed by a trailer to death. 500 meters before the gate of the factory. Amen. And he left another company, a similar company, two weeks ago before he joined that company. He has come for interview for more than three months and they did not choose him. There are a lot of other people that have come and they did not choose him. Then suddenly the company decided, how can we be doing interview? We cannot get one person. Any one of them that is good, the best, bring him in. They will train him. That was why he was employed. That's the point. Then he get, to the, he get to the company. For one reason or the other, the department that he is, they have been having issues with working weekends. Suddenly, it was when he come that they decided to start working weekends again. <laughs> Number two. Three, it was not part of those that were listed to work that day. But the factory manager just went to the factory and said, Let's use this weekend to repair this machine that has been here for so long ago. That guy that just came, I think he's good in this area. Put his name. And he was coming on that Saturday morning. Early in the morning, supposed to receive seven. By 6.30 a.m., a trailer crushed him. 500 meters before the gate. And I was reviewing the issue. The family told us that he prayed and fasted to get that job. And that after getting that job, he celebrated that job. And he promised his wife and children, life will be better now. I will take proper care of you. Did he not see goodness of God? Did he not see the goodness of God? Yes, of course, he saw the goodness of God. That was why what he prayed for happened. But he did not receive mercy.
he did not receive mercy yes it was a minus for him mercy was missing mercy will not be missing in your day in your so that's why I used to tell the men when we pray I said from not even as a servant of God or anything from the benefit of insight I have come to realize that any unanswered prayer has a purpose I've always told them when we're having our vigil, as any unanswered prayer has a purpose. It's not a, it's not even a revelation for me. It is benefit of insight when I review a lot of things that has happened before to me and to some men of God and to some people I know. So when you pray for goodness, ask for mercy. Mercy can do anything from you. Eh? God will say, I will have mercy. God will say, He does not qualify for it. David is supposed to die. He obtained mercy. Solomon messed up. He obtained mercy. Joseph will have gone astray. He obtained mercy. Judas was denied mercy and he died. Peter got mercy and he became the rock that Jesus was built on. I pray for you this morning. Whenever it is necessary, at the point of your breakthrough, mercy will speak for you. When the weather becomes so tough and there are various options for you, mercy will direct you. As you request and as you go in your quest for success, the power that is above all power will order your step with mercy. When you think the system is altered and is favoring you because you did not know where the end would be, the mercy of God will make a revelation for you. Over your family, over your children, over your finances, over your businesses, the mercy of God will not depart. We only bring it up as a matter of um, sharing what is happening. Ah, Fiorara. It's a very sad thing. As a matter of fact, we sat down at the company board level and we decided to even do something out of normal, out of range, because we are touched. And we see the wife and the children. And the wife was saying, you promised me and my children that Farabale at Idebe. Amen. At the point of your success, at the point of your blessing, at the point of your broke, at the point of your breakthrough, the powers of darkness shall not overcome you. Whatever could be that could be pushing you in the direction of destruction, because of the power on this mountain, the spirit of God shall release you from that bondage. Sweet testimony shall be your path, and you continue to live in the presence of God forever and forever in Jesus' name. Finally, before we round up, let me just take one more. You have to develop a strong prayer life connection with God. Amen. Amen. A strong prayer life connection with God. Strong prayer life connection with God. Must be based on prayer. You see, prayer does a lot of things. It does not mean that you have to pray for 96 hours, for 25 hours, for 36 hours. I was, I was in a short program yesterday with some ministers of God, and the man, one of our fathers said, Amy, you need to go to the house, and you need to go to the house, and you to go to I went to pray for 18 days, non-stop. And I said, I told him, but I don't have the power to pray for 18 days. I don't even want the grace. And I'm not asking for it. And I'm not looking for the problem that will make me to pray non-stop for 18 days. <laughs> he said, ah, I don't want. Amen. Amen. Your connection to God with prayer does not mean that you just continue to pray without basis or you the next thing you sit down ah. One of the uh, church comes up with seven powerful prayers. Come on, ah, I'm a lobe, I'm a lobe. We have finished there. Ah, this, this church is powerful. There is another three days prayer. You go there. At the end of the day, you end up doing nothing. Just rolling up and down. 
And I tell you, a lot of people are falling into that trap. They are falling into that trap. They are falling into that trap. I know one young woman, I, I still pity her. Because she's a single mother, I still pity her. But she has so much built her life on. There is a prayer here. There is a, God blesses her with the works of her hand. So much. She's blessed. But every blessing coming of that thing is going into, Allah, oh we are looking for car. We want to go to this mountain. Tomorrow we are coming back. That's under, when do you want to have rest, my sister? God will not make that your portion. Yeah. Establish a connection with God and pray to him. God is everywhere. That is why we established in the beginning that God is everywhere. God is in your life. God is in the church. So there is nowhere you cannot pray and establish connection to church. Even the one we do on this mountain is even more than enough. You have the Sunday service, you pray to God. You have intercessors, they will pray. You have the program on Tuesday, you have the program on Wednesday, you have the Word Alive on Thursday. First Friday, we have a very detailed prophetic prayer session. Then what else are you looking for? Connect to that prayer line. It is a relationship with God. How many, how many of us have a father that is not with him? And you not hear from your father for one month and you'll be happy. How many are living with your parents or with your children and you not talk to one another in a day? Okay, then how many of you talk to God daily apart from Sunday? Begin to ask yourself. You wake up in the morning, the first thing you pick up is your phone. Just quickly check it, do what's up, rush to the bedroom, get out. You may not even remember two, three days. For those that remember, they will be pretending they will be on that. Oh, I'm on that. Oh, my family, oh, family. And then why we greet him? Hey, 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 Okada. Ah, Amen. So disrespect you of God. Establish that relationship. Create time for Him. In the morning, before you sleep, at midday when you have the opportunity, do it. It's not a question of shame. We have seen people in high offices, high area. You get there, you knock. Ah, it's not. It's inside. We well, can't open the door. No, it's like it's always meditating around this time. High level people, chairman, CEO of big companies. So what is it? Establish a relationship with God. Talk to your father every day. And I pray as you talk, God will answer your prayer. In this month of divine answer prayer, God will be with you. Let's round up on our feet. Let's round up on our feet. Faith, we need to round up. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to have only one prayer. God, knock me down and rebuild me. Reconnect my relationship with you. Whatever could be preventing the smoothness of my relationship with you, because of the blood of Jesus, God, break me through. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. Thank God. God, knock me down. Rebuild me. Establish my relationship with you. Maintain my connection with you. And let my steps be divinely ordered. Father, give me a divine time in your presence. And the mighty name of Jesus. Father, block me down today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last one. God, wherever I go, whatever I do, let your mercy speak for me. Let your mercy order my steps. What you have not destined for me, oh, what will lead to my destruction, oh, don't let Lord. my leg find oh, way to there. Father, so continue to guide me. Father, and let your mercy be my helper. Mm. Open your mouth and speak to God. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want to know. Father,